AMD has undergone quite a few changes over here. First of all, uh, there was uh, the separation of the Radeon Technology Group to get a greater focus on graphics. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Southeast Asian fabs were sort of uh, well lent over to another company. Okay, cool. Uh, and basically, there seem to be a lot of restructuring happening. So, how is AMD building its new direction? Well, Matun, we actually started restructuring about five years ago because it, uh, it started with a redirection in terms of our energies of R&D. There's a long lead time for brand new technologies. So we started our redirection when we started a new team on a new high performance core, which we're now rolling out to market in Zen, uh, and then uh, really retooling a lot of the engineering first, uh, in, uh, as I said, on our Zen core, our graphics products to ensure very, very competitive graphics and, and a full lineup of graphics products every year. And even the technology as to how we put CPU graphics and our other IPs together, which we call our infinity fabric. So this started some years ago. And each year, uh, we've been able to make excellent progress in our development and focus the company leading up to, with our focus on graphics, the formation of the Radiant Technology Group, as you mentioned. In terms of China and what we've done there, uh, partnerships, that's about addressing more of the market. Uh, really, uh, you know, uh, partnering. We have a partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, and with, a, with a microprocessor effort. And uh, again, uh, with uh, what we did with uh, Tianjin, uh, and uh, we've allowed a uh, partnership that will uh, create a product uh, which is sanctioned uh, by the government uh, to really reach uh, deeper into uh, the market, which is restricted to indigenous uh, design. So that's an excellent partnership. That's underway. And then uh, we also had parts of our pack and assembly manufacturing. We had divested the fab some years ago. Yeah. Uh, but now the OSAT, the industry OSAT effort, is uh, quite developed. And so it was not necessary to keep that uh, pack and assembly as part of AMD. Mm -hmm. And so we also entered a, uh, a partnership there with Nantang Fujitsu. Yeah. And that's been uh, going quite well. So, uh, you've been dominating the console uh, segment for this particular generation and with the move from uh, proprietary architecture to x86, they're sort of slowly moving towards what the PC space has been. So, uh, would you continue to target uh, a custom SoC sort of or a custom chip for next generation consoles or is it going to become more mainstream and you can just take your generic desktop uh, Radeon chips and just place it in the consoles? Well, the beauty of our semi excuse me, the beauty of our uh, semi-custom market is that it leverages the technology from AMD roadmap. So we have you know strong technology roadmap on our CPUs, our graphics, our video and display technology, multimedia, and so on. Uh, and that's what we use to write, uh, create our, uh, our our Radeon products. That's how we're creating you know our products around our CPU, our APU, uh, and. It's that technology that uh, won the semi-custom uh, business that we have today. So, uh, of course, uh, we'll compete uh, going forward. We've won a next generation uh, that we've talked about uh, with the next generation, both Sony and Microsoft. Uh, you've seen the, uh, the Sony uh, product is out this year, and Microsoft announced a Scorpio uh, for 2017. And uh, for future uh, uh, opportunities and game console behind that, we will again uh, compete to win based on the strength of the technology roadmap that we have at AMD. When you demoed the uh, Zen in August, it was clocked at 3 gigahertz and mm -hmm. demoed it with the uh, IPC performance being 40% greater mm -hmm. than Excavator Core. And later, about last week, uh, it was raised to 3.4 gigahertz. So by the time it ships, could you give us an estimate as to how high the base clocks and the boost clocks could be? You bet. Well, these events that you referred to, uh, we're just trying to basically, uh, you know, show our customers uh, that, that we're right on track. You know, we said that we would be uh, completing the Zen Core design this year, 2016, completing test and getting it out to market in uh, first quarter. With uh, now we, uh, our brand is Ryzen, as it will come out in a desktop configuration. And so, uh, what we did in the demo last week uh, was we uh, competed with the highest end of uh, Intel, Broadwell uh, 6900. And what we uh, did was we did run a fixed frequency at 3.4. And the competitor actually had boost frequency yes. running. 
And so, you know, what we're doing is uh, we're uh, not releasing all the final configuration. That'll, that'll be coming soon uh, at launch. Uh, but we're really trying to show uh, everyone the capability of Zen and the capability of Ryzen uh, because we can compete with i7. We can compete with the uh, highest end processor in the market today. And, you know, that's what the customers have been waiting for. They've been asking AMD, please come back with high performance and bring competition back to the market. So, uh, can I assume that Ryzen would be broken down into different segments for the enthusiasts, for the mainstream consumer market, and for the thin and light form factors? Yes, Ryzen is designed to address the, uh, the full range of market space. Uh, we'll, we'll start uh, in the uh, you know, desktop, a range of configurations uh, in the desktop, and we have a, a design which combines not only the Zen Core, but advanced graphics technology. Uh, that will uh, go to market in the second half of 2017. And that's going to go uh, where you want high performance right in the notebook. So you want long battery life, yet high performance. Uh, that's exactly what we're going to target. So this would be part of uh, which uh, code name? This is Raven Ridge. Raven Ridge. This mm -hmm. would be the APUs. That is the APU. So all of the competitors are sort of not only focusing on the core technology areas like uh, let's say NVIDIA is also focusing on machine learning and uh, deep learning mm -hmm. and uh, autonomous vehicles Intel is sort of going towards IoT and 5G so AMD just launched Radeon Instinct mm -hmm. so that's one way of uh, moving your focus towards machine learning are there any other verticals that uh, AMD is working on? No, there is but you know when you think about our, our focus in AMD it's built on the foundation we have. We, we not only have uh, this high performance CPU with Zen, right, that we're, that we're launching, but we have uh, such a long tradition of outstanding graphics performance. And now with Vega coming out in the first half of 2017, uh, we can compete at the highest end of performance of GPU compute and visualization. So when you look at our focus, it's leveraging those two key building blocks. And where we're focused on is really gaming, where we've been uh, very, very strong and we see a very bright uh, future. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the emerging areas of immersive computing, right? And, uh, you know, those tie in very, very well with gaming. And then, of course, it's, uh, it's compute, where we go after uh, with a client compute with our APUs and we're re-entering the data center. Uh, and when we re-enter the data center, it will be with both our CPU and our graphics technology. Graphics technology uh, is outstanding uh, to accelerate, particularly the heavy lifting associated with uh, machine learning, where you have you know, these convolutional neural nets, where you have multiple stages, uh, where you need very, very high horsepower graphics, and they're easy to program. People know how to gr program our graphics pro uh, products. And we can marry that with our Zen CPU. So Vega is designed to work seamlessly with Zen cores. And, in our data center. So you'd have a Vega-based Radeon Pro working with a Zen-based Naples. That's exactly correct. Optron processor. Right. Or is it something else? Is it going to be Optron? We haven't announced the brand name, but it's our uh, Zen uh, core-based uh, product in the Naples server. I'm guessing it's going to be a different brand then. <laughs> you got to stay tuned there. More news coming. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, what about the mobile segment uh, regarding laptops as well mm -hmm. as uh, not only the Zen but also Radeon? Uh, not much has been spoken other than the fact that in the Macau event it was mentioned that uh, very thin form factor GPUs can be manufactured, but uh, SKUs were not announced at that particular time. So, could you give us a roadmap sure. as to when that will happen? Well, uh, we are shipping the products that we announced uh, at that time in Macau. So, if you look at our Polaris launched, Right. with our RX 480, which sort of revolutionized bringing, you know, VR-ready discrete graphics down to a very affordable price, right? $200 U.S. Uh, price range of discrete graphics that can run VR. So really trying to democratize and open up the market to many, many more people. Uh, so that's been, uh, that's been uh, shipping well, uh, as well as we've since announced uh, the RX 470 and 460. So we have a range of, uh, of products based on the Polaris technology. You know, you can also uh, just point to the recent uh, MacBook Pro announcements, oh. where in fact it's including that very same uh, technology in their lineup, uh, where they use discrete graphics. It's in fact uh, based on Polaris. 
so that's the professional uh, segment right uh, when you move towards the mainstream would uh, how how long would it be before we start seeing uh, the radeon series uh, polaris based cpus and mainstream notebooks uh, you'll see uh, in the coming uh, months you're going to see uh, new lines of products uh, that are very much targeted there and you're going to see uh, uh, announcements with our partners uh, right in the mainstream you know people had uh, thought some years ago uh, that in that mainstream of the market that discrete graphics would go away they said it's all be handled by integrated graphics of course we have integrated graphics in our uh, APUs and they're quite strong but it turns out that the appetite uh, for consumers for high performance graphics is quite strong uh, the displays are now much higher resolution more pixels than they used to be and so it turns out that uh, that those predictions were wrong and that right into the mainstream of the market uh, you're seeing the demand uh, for discrete graphics uh, right into the mobile platforms so uh, we noticed that Vega opted for HBM2 for the flagship SKUs mm -hmm. the 16 uh, computing at one but for the lower end uh, you opted for GDDR5 I believe so could you shed more light into this particular decision well it's quite simple uh, uh, HBM, high bandwidth memory, is an outstanding technology, but it's certainly more expensive than uh, GDDR5. And so uh, we uh, simply, uh, at this time, are offering that in our high-end SKUs and, and continue uh, to leverage GDDR5 uh, in the mainstream. Over time, you will see a more opportunity for uh, high bandwidth memory because as the volume goes up and the maturity comes to that new uh, technology and the build process, uh, I think you'll see that kind of performance advantage uh, go uh, broader in product lines in the future. So while uh, you are sort of uh, readying Naples line for launch, what exactly has the enterprise segment uh, looking for? Is, is, it, is it like traditional compute requirements have the remained or is it different altogether? Well, it turns out uh, that the data center is becoming more diverse. And so there is a traditional uh, demand, and uh, the market wants competition. When I say traditional, what do I mean? Uh, there's a, I'll say, a more uh, prevalent configuration, which is a dual socket, right? A 2P configuration. Uh, it's quite prevalent in the industry. Uh, it, it makes actually the majority of the market. And we play right there. So if you want a 2P server based on Naples, we're going to have incredibly strong performance. But what you're also seeing is more diversity where data centers are having to tailor for the demand. It might mean that they need deep memory pools. It might mean that they want to have uh, graphics attached for machine learning workloads, as we discussed earlier. And we're optimizing to give flexibility for our customers. We want to come back with competition and flexibility. So if you want to attach a, a Radeon Pro GPUs, uh, you can do that quite easily with the Naples form factor. We have uh, slots uh, to provision to provide that. And in fact, they connect peer to peer. So you do not need any additional circuitry in a 2P configuration. As you populate both sockets with graphics, they're going to connect uh, to each processor and then across socket in a peer to peer fashion with the embedded circuitry and controls, which we've designed in. So given that this is the enterprise segment and you just mentioned that uh there'll be more focus on high bandwidth requirements. So would it work with a traditional DDR RAM or would you actually move towards a different solution? Well, in the data center, you have a range as you, you know, so of course you have the Naples configuration, which is DDR4. And as you add graphics, you know, it's of course, you know, through standard interconnectivity. And so you can put a range of graphics or other accelerators uh, through that PCIe uh, connectivity uh, and you know each configuration uh, would be if for instance high end as we discussed earlier with Vega uh, with the with the R9 before it, it would be leveraging HBM high bandwidth memory uh, but you can certainly uh, based on uh, you know the uh, cost point or the workload you're running uh, you may in fact have uh, you know um, uh, more mainstream uh, graphics cards with uh, graphics uh, DDR5 so Ryzen and Polaris are both using uh, 14 nanometer FinFET process and AMD made the jump from 28 nanometers to 14 nanometers after quite a long time and no doubt given all the investment and the R&D we've done 
a lot of SKUs are going to be released in this particular manufacturing process. So, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how long will AMD be on 14 nanometer processor mm -hmm. before moving on to sure. something else? No, it's a great question, but think about what's going on in the semiconductor industry. Uh, for high performance, you're seeing longer time in a given node. So 28 nanometer was a long node, as you, as you note. Uh, why? Uh, because you, you want to leverage that technology, tune and optimize, and you want to jump when you get a significant performance per energy, performance per watt benefit. And that's exactly what 14 and 16 nanometer have done for us across our, our roadmap. Uh, and it will be a long node just like 28 because it delivers such, a, such an improvement. Uh, you know, we also, you know, you look ahead, you'll see the same thing where there'll be an interim technology that's probably a bit more optimized for, mo for mobile devices like uh, smartphones. So that's what 10 nanometer is in the industry. And then uh, the next node would be likely better optimized for high performance. That's what seven nanometer will be in the industry. So, you know, my view is that the long nodes, as I call them, where you, where you see uh, staying power are 28, 14, 16, and then again, seven. Uh, for the kind of market we serve, uh, these nodes have great value proposition and uh, they will indeed uh, be around for a product line for several years. So uh, the next question is about the Indian market. So uh, the Indian market is primarily a price conscious market, which is why the Athlon 2 series did so well. And even the FX series right now does quite well. The 6300 is one of the most popular processes. So I wanted your perspective on the Indian market. How does AMD view India? Well, one thing that's clear, uh, India uh, is, I think the Indian market uh, is uh, really conscious of the kind of technology uh, that can deliver high quality at an affordable price. And so when we think of India, it lines up with our strategy of, as I said, democratizing access to this technology. So you look at the, our competitor on graphics, uh, it's, it's quite expensive. And I think it takes it out of the reach of, I'll say, a broader, a broader market. So what we want to do is uh, on graphics, and as well, you'll see over time a range of SKUs with our Zen Core, first in desktop, uh, and then in the uh, in the APUs, uh, you know, uh, we intend to op you know really open up that ability to get that premium performance, uh, which our new line of products will come out with, uh, off uh, you know at, at a broad range at a much more affordable price than our competitors are offering today. Uh, but we'll still uh, you know have a full range. So even as we introduce the Ryzen product. Uh, we will continue to have a value, a brand that sits uh, underneath it, and it has even a broader, more affordable access. So that's our thinking. Okay. Uh, what I've heard, speaking to the competitors, is that uh, a little extra R&D has to be done, especially for the Southeast Asian markets, because the lower end SKUs sell like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. uh, certain SKUs, the very bottom ones, sell about at the rate of five units per hour, which is quite huge for some of the brands. Does AMD actually see similar sales for uh, the low-end SKUs in India? We do, and we partner with our OEMs on, on such bids. So, you know, what we'll see is uh, large government tenders or, or in, the, in just the uh, general uh, consumer market uh, demand for you know, that type of value, which as you said, can sell, you know, it, uh, you know less expensive, so margins are, um, are lower. Uh, but you can get a, you know, certainly a high volume opportunity. Uh, so we do service that today and we'll continue in the future. Uh, what about the embedded segment? Mm -hmm. What are AMD's plans for the embedded segment? Well, what we typically do is uh, when we invest in new technology, uh, what we want to do first is uh, start with uh, a volume base uh, that, that uh, you know, like we're doing with the Zen Core as we go out into desktop. Uh, and then when you look at what's going to happen is we'll take that same core configuration and of course to go in with embedded there's unique requirements. You need unique uh, enablement from software, unique uh, test that you have to do. Uh, so embedded with any of our new technologies like Zen that you see introduced, uh, you can see that there'll be a, a, a delay uh, to put all of the support required for embedded, uh, which I mentioned, and uh, then we will launch it there. So uh, really uh, there's a, you know, uh, there's a demand across uh, all of our markets for this return of a high performance CPU from AMD and uh, we're going to get it out as fast as we can across the various segments. Uh, with GPU open, AMD outsourced quite a lot of technologies. 
So we open sourced. Yeah. So we uh, we're wondering how big an impact has it had on the industry and as well as AMD uh, because of this particular move. Well, we're really starting to see a strong pull. So I can't tell you how many customers I've met with uh, that said uh, that they are very happy with our strategy. Why? Because they're not locked in. That's one. Two, it opens up a community of programmers, right? It, so uh, it makes it easier uh, for you know our, our customers to actually get applications uh, which will run on our platform because we've actually lowered the barrier uh, to create them. Uh, so it's a very, very important part of our strategy, and it was one that we gave a lot of thought to. Uh, you know, again, just like we wanted with our uh, Polaris announcement, you know, we priced it to bring uh, such a high capability, a VR-ready uh, capability, uh, out at a, uh, a price point that many more people could afford it. That's really behind our GPU open strategy as well. Really open this up, create a community, and help the whole industry accelerate what we want is to accelerate VR and AR, to accelerate these machine learning applications, because that is going to grow the overall market and create more demand, and we, you know, we will service it with these new products. Recently, I believe uh, last week itself, you also announced HIP, which is the heterogeneous sort of uh, interconnect portability protocol for enabling CUDA applications to work on uh, more AMD uh, units. Yeah. So uh, could you explain uh, the rationale behind that particular API? You bet. You mentioned uh, just a moment ago uh, that we have a GPU open. It's actually, that's the website as well, www.gpuopen.com. And when you go there, you'll see uh, that we put uh, not only an open sourced a driver set, uh, but also key elements of the tool chain for the segments of the market that we go after. And when you look at what we're doing uh, with uh, what you mentioned, uh, HIP, HIP, it's part of a broader effort that we call Radeon Open Compute Platform, Rockham. And what we have is, of course, HIP, uh, which allows you uh, to have that interface portability. So customers could take their CUDA code, run HIP, and it puts it over into a format that can be compiled right onto Radeon. By the way, you can compile it right back to, uh, you know, to uh, CUDA without uh, loss of performance, but now you're on a format uh, that, that you know, can be uh, compiled uh, to the target technology of your choice, not being locked in from a proprietary standpoint. So uh, uh, HIP and the associated HCC, our heterogeneous compiler, uh, we have that technology that, uh, that we had actually been developing for years. We were the founding member of the Heterogeneous System Architecture Foundation. And we've been investing uh, for the software base that would allow that kind of flexibility and optimization. And we're really happy to bring it to market and to bring it to open market in an open source way. That code is posted, once again, up on uh, gpuopen.com. So that's about all the questions that I had. Uh, thank you for uh you know, agreeing to this interaction. Of course, Benjamin. Very, very good to uh, meet with you this afternoon. Thank you.